Psalm 72, 1 through 14. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. May he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills, the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. May he endure as long as the sun, as long as as the moon through the generations. May he be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his day, may the righteousness flourish and prosperity about till the moon is no more. May he rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May the desert tribes bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the Tarshish and the distant shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Zeba present him gifts. May all kings bow down to him and all nations serve him, for he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. This is the word of the Lord. God is good. And all the time. Well, good morning. Uh, hello, Alexi. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> uh, my name is Andrew. I'm the pastor of Families and Community here. Today is an intergenerational worship experience, which means we invite children and children at heart to go ahead and come on up for our little uh, memory verse uh, activity that we do. This is a day at the start of a month where we get to talk and share a little bit about what the kids are doing in their areas, and we get to share a little bit about what they're learning with you, so you get a peek into uh, the types of things that they're doing in their spaces. And this next month, what's going to happen is our elementary and preschool are going to be looking... Welcome back, Lundgrens! Oh my goodness! So happy to see you. Oh, you're getting hugs and everything. Wow. That never happens when I walk in a room. No, it does. It does. Uh, Where was I? So excited about the Lundgrens, I forgot. Oh yeah, so the pre-K and elementary are going to be talking about Abraham, and our fourth, fifth, and sixth graders are going to be talking about the prophets. And I would say that both of these have a lot to do with kings and empires and ancient nations living in empires and living under kings and living under authority, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. But before we do that, there is a memory verse that you practice. It's super easy. In fact, we memorized it right now. And if you would like, I'm going to have the microphone, I'm going to pass it to you, and you may say the memory verse, and you get today whatever happens to be in this box. You could tell by the sound it's lollipops? Like I opened it and it goes, lollipop, lollipop. It is lollipops. Good job, Sage. Well done. Uh, We have, and these are sugar-free, so no cavities. Um, Is that how cavities work? No. No. Okay. They're sugar-free, so no, I don't know, whatever. No crazy kids. kids. Okay. Uh, I'm just saying what they're saying. This is not what I'm saying, just to clarify. Okay, so would anybody like to try the memory verse for today? Alexi, you've been asking me since this morning, so I'm going to let you go first, not just because you are my daughter. Are you ready? Okay, go for it. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Fantastic. <laughs> Survey says, is that correct? Oh, it is correct? You all memorized it last month? Good job, adults. <laughs> All right, Alexi, go ahead and pick a lollipop. Would anybody else like to give it a try? Can I get the lollipop? Well, you, you have, the, these lollipops are not free. Uh, you've been gone for two months. We'll talk after service. So one of the things that I want to reiterate is that I was never good at memorizing. Memorizing is one of my worst fears, still is. It's very hard for me. And as a kid, I remember the memorizing and trying to go and tell people what you'd memorize was always very difficult and very embarrassing for me. So if you do not want to memorize, and if you do not want to come up here, you can always come talk to me, and we'll talk about what this verse means in your life, or you can tell me a little story, and you can have a lollipop. Okay? Does that sound like a deal, uh, Hannah Lundgren? Does that sound like a deal? Okay. She just said yeah to whatever, but okay, great. Okay. Well done. 
So, rest. Rest is important. Rest is very important. And I love that Jesus, the king, invites us to rest. And so we have, king who, we have Jesus who is a shepherd and is also a king. What do you think that means about him being a king? Is he going to be a king who's going to make you work all the time and get really tired? Or is he going to be a king who's going to be like a shepherd who sometimes will give you rest and relaxation and salvation? What do you think? Number two, that is correct. And a lot of the Old Testament talks a lot about kingdoms, living kingdoms. And what that means for them. And so today, yes, everyone, sorry, can you share the mic? Yes, absolutely. Sorry, Do you all need to use the other mic, or would you rather? Use the other one? Right here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I'm stuck now, so. <laughs> sorry, everybody. Okay, so we're going to talk about kingdom. Before I came up here today, uh, I asked a, a few people what, they, what came to their mind when I said the word king. And I collected some images and I collected some ideas, but I want to hear from you before we look at the images of what people told me. What comes to your mind when you think of king? And you can answer or you can answer. One little caveat, yes, King Jesus. That is a good answer. But I want you to think other than that for, for this activity, okay? So what comes to your mind when you think of a king? Yes, Cameron. Well, they're, in control. they're in control, okay? And can any of you, that? yeah, absolutely. Can any of you think of, a, a, of different kingly characters in the past? King, king what? King Arthur. king Arthur, that's right. The once and future king is one of my favorite books about King Arthur, yes. King Ahasuerus, <laughs> very good. <laughs> From the, from the musical. Well done. I saw Preeti already started singing. Anyone else? King Henry VIII. Yes, he went through a few wives. Was that King Henry VIII? Yes, divorce. And yes, that's a sad story. That's what kings do. Yes. Queen Mary. Okay, so we're at a queen, a Queen Mary. Okay. So here are some, some names or some ideas that came up when we were talking about this. So my, I instantly think of King Aragorn because I grew up reading the Lord of the Rings or my parents read Lord of the Rings to me. And so I always think of King Aragorn. Another king that came up was King T'Challa, who is both a superhero and also a king. So double responsibility. He's got one of the hardest uh, Marvel Universe jobs out there. Uh, the other one that was mentioned to me uh, was uh, Burger King. Very good king, I guess. He gives us burgers. Uh, Kyle Michelson brought up Caesar, right? So first we had Julius Caesar, and then all the Caesars named Caesar after that. Caesar, and that was definitely on the mind of people when Jesus was around. Then we also have some biblical ones. We have King David. Here's an artist representation of King David. We also have his son, King Solomon. Here's a stained glass window of King Solomon. And then one of the ones that comes up, I feel, often with our students is uh, this one. And that would be King George. That is King George. I watched that with my daughters because this is also Kristoff from Frozen, by the way, this actor. So he's good at being a nice guy. He's also good at being a ruthless uh, king. An idea comes to your mind when you think of the word king. And ideas come to my mind. Well, to ancient Israel, there was an idea on their mind about what a king should look like. And Psalm 72 paints a picture of what ancient Israel was thinking when they thought about what it meant to be kingly. And Psalm 72, by the way, is known by fancy pants uh, commentators all around the world as the most majestic psalm. The most majestic psalm, because it really paints a broad and wonderful picture of what it means to be a king. And it gives us an idea for what the Old Testament authors were thinking when they thought of the word king. And if you listen to what Blythe was reading this morning, I think you would agree with me that the psalm has some surprises or some twists, some things that maybe you aren't associating with a king. In general, when I think of a king, I think power, I think control, 
I think violence, swords, lofty accents, and fancy hats, of course. There's agreement in this general row, by the way, up here about fancy hats. And capes, flowing fancy capes as well. There is a little bit of this in the psalm, but most of it, what is repeated at the beginning and at the, at the end, is something that has nothing to do with that at all. Being a king in this psalm is about justice making. It is about, it is about delivering the needy and the poor, paying attention to the vulnerable, fighting off the oppressor. See, to the ancient nations around Israel at the time, this type of king, one who's paying attention to those who are at the bottom, would have seemed like something of a joke. Kings were powerful. Kings were meant to be godlike. Kings were meant to be fierce, violent. They were meant to strike fear, strike fear in the hearts of their enemies, and often through terrible and ruthless means. That is what a king was to the nations who were around Israel. And the funny thing is that despite the fact that Israel was in a space where they could see all these brutal kings around them, you would think that Israel would say, well, we're not going to be like that. We're going to be a different type of place. But instead, they cried out to God and they said to God, we want to be like all those other nations. We want to have a king as well. They begged for it. They wanted to conform. They didn't want to be different. See, God had set Israel up as this special nation that was going to do things completely different. They were going to be holy, which means they were going to be justice-oriented. They were going to be caring for the orphan, the widow, the poor, the immigrant. They were going to be holy rebels. Holy rebels to a world ruled by tyrants and egomaniacs. One of the things that's hardest for me to understand from the Bible, and I'm going to say this to you, it's okay for me to say what I struggle with with the Bible. Sometimes what I struggle with, with the Bible and with God, is that God consistently appears to be willing to work with people. It would be much easier if God would just fix it for us, but instead, or I would think it would be a lot easier, but instead what God consistently does is invites us into relationship, into partnership, into being part of his kingdom and of bringing these solutions about. So God said to Israel, okay, you can have a king. But if you're going to have a king, this king needs to lead you into being a holy rebel of a nation. This king needs to lead you to be different. So Israel was going to have a king that was going to turn everything inside out and upside down, it was going to rebel against what the other kings around them were like by following God's ways, seeking the well-being of the poor, the vulnerable, the powerless. This was a king that was not going to look like any other king. He was going to lead a rebellion, a holy rebellion, in the ancient land where they existed. Does that sound exciting? Amen? Sort of, kind of. It's very exciting. <laughs> very, very exciting. This was going to be a holy, holy rebellion. Unfortunately, as we read at the beginning of the psalm, this psalm was dedicated to King Solomon. And King Solomon was one of those kings who started off really strong. Do any of you remember how King Solomon started? What was, what was the first thing he did when he became king? He did stuff, yes. <laughs> he prayed for something. Do you remember what he prayed for? He didn't want riches. He wanted, he wanted no, not stuff. Anybody from the audience remember? Uh, from the rest of the congregation? Yes. Something. He wanted something, yes. Wisdom. He wanted wisdom. He started off strong. This is what he initially prayed for. But by the end of his life, Solomon in the Old Testament is described as being like Pharaoh, which was a king that had been terribly cruel to Israel before. He was described as being like Pharaoh. He wasn't a rebel. Solomon was a cruel taskmaster. He wasn't looking out for the poor and the vulnerable. He was instead forcing his people to build palaces and homes for no pay. 
Solomon, just like all the other kings, ended up being not a holy rebel, but a conformist. Somebody who was going to do what everybody else around him was doing. Ignoring God's ways and God's love for the poor and the needy. So I think when we read this psalm and we think of King Solomon and all the other lists of kings that come up there, we often find ourselves disappointed. But if we can read this psalm about a king and think about Jesus, the king, then I think you'll agree with me, we rejoice. And rebellion starts to look like an awfully good thing if it's with Jesus by our side. Jesus is the true holy rebel. He uses his power, his authority to reign the world, to turn it inside out and upside down. Paying attention first to the vulnerable, the downtrodden, and the needy. Something unheard of, even still today. I think you would agree with me. The kingdom belongs to such as these, declares Jesus. And as you know, Jesus' rebellion was so striking, was so emphatic, was so dangerous, was so upsetting to the kings that were ruling at the time that the world's authorities couldn't, couldn't deal with it. They couldn't help but take Jesus, try to take Jesus out of the picture. Spoiler alert, it didn't work. So friends, young and slightly older, Consider your own life, your own life. If you are a follower of King Jesus, then you share in the responsibility of King Jesus' kingdom. And with the Holy Spirit's help, we can, be, we can start a whole new... <laughs> what is this? <laughs> it's a unicorn horn. Okay, sorry, everybody. There's a unicorn horn on uh, Rhea's head right now, and it totally just... Caught my attention. <laughs> With the Holy Spirit's help, we, we can be a whole new generation even now of queens and kings that share in Jesus' glory, in Jesus' beautiful kingdom making, participate in Jesus' holy rebellion. And I believe that that rebellion, that act of following Jesus will give us great and incredible joy where we care for the vulnerable, redeem God's children from oppression and violence. Whether you are working or you're at school, because are there people in your school and in your settings who need help, who need mercy, who need kindness, who need patience, love, justice? What do you think, Hannah? Do you think there are people in your school who need that? Yes, absolutely. We practice this rebellion in many ways. Wherever you may go, I pray that you would do that as well, and that we would strive together for compassion, justice, and mercy, holy rebels with a holy cause to do our part to celebrate Jesus' in-breaking kingdom. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now here at church, we practice this rebellion every week by gathering together and coming as we truly are, uh, having a great week or having the worst and most terrible of weeks. But we come here in honesty to recognize how much we need Jesus, how much we need this in-breaking kingdom, and then to challenge each other to continue working towards that kingdom together with God throughout the week. We also do things like practice little rituals that are meant to inspire us in our holy rebellion. Not rebellion, in our holy rebellion. There are two particular rituals that we practice in this church, and the second one is we come to the table together. We come to the table and we have communion together. And we remember Jesus' all-too-rebellious but gentle response to the violent kingdom around him. But the other thing we do is we present and we dedicate our babies. And so I want to invite the O family up here, and I want you to stay here because you're going to be part of this. We're going to invite the O family up so that we can practice one of these little holy rebellions together. Yes. He looks beautiful. I love your dress, Olivia. She just ate, so she should be happy. <laughs> Is she going to spit up? Maybe. Oh, yes. <laughs> We're recording, right? Okay. Today, today, we rejoice 
in God's gift of new life. The wonder of creation manifested in birth and the gracious promises we are given concerning our children. The scriptures teach us that children are God's possession and that we are charged with the responsibility of caring for them and raising them in the training and instruction of the Lord, not merely for themselves, but for the life of the world. Sayin, Rebecca, in bringing Olivia to God's house today, you acknowledge that she is among those whom Jesus called the little ones who believe in me. You are also consecrating yourselves to God, promising to do everything you can to encourage your child to become a true disciple of Christ. Will you, by God's help, provide a Christian home for this child and bring her up in the worship and teaching of the church that she may come to know Christ as her Savior and follow him as Lord? If so, answer I will. I will. Amen. They will not do this alone. We are the body of Christ. We together are drawn to love. And so I have an invitation for you, family, and that also includes you who are sitting up here, too, because this is your sister, which Hannah is so excited about. <laughs> so will you, beloved family, be faithful to your calling as members of the body of Christ so that Olivia and all other children in our midst may grow up in the knowledge and love of Jesus? If so, answer, we will. Amen. Olivia, your name, your name, your parents thought long and hard about what to name you. Or did you? Or did you just know, actually? You did a little bit, maybe. <laughs> a little bit, maybe. Your parents named you with great intention. Yes. <laughs> and wonderful purpose. Your parents have said this, Olivia, about your name. You'll remember none of this, but we'll keep saying it to you. <laughs> the olive tree is used many times in the Bible as a symbol of beauty, abundance, peace, and hope. The tree's fruitfulness and ability to thrive are often used to represent righteous people. And so I'd like to invite Rebecca to explain to us uh, a little bit more about her name and also about a verse that they pray over Olivia together. Yeah, um, her middle name, Anha in Korean means Milky Way or Galaxy, and if you know us, you know we love the mountains. So we hope that Olivia will learn to love and enjoy God's creation like we do. Um, when I was in middle school-ish, my grandmother gave me my first study Bible. She had it monogrammed, it was beautiful, and in the inscription she wrote Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. So today I pass that on to Olivia. Uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. That's beautiful. Thank you, Rebecca. Olivia, can I hold you for a second? I will ask you. <laughs> oh, don't cry. You can do it. <laughs> Hello? You can spit up on me. That's totally okay. All right. Olivia, we present you to God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. Give you. Okay, so if you would, and I want to invite you kids to do this too, raise a hand, and we're going to pray for Olivia. If your arm gets tired, you can always do this, so we do in other places, puppeteering. Let's pray together. Oh God, giver of life, bless Olivia. May she, like the olive tree, come to embody and resemble your beauty, your abundance, your peace, your hope. 
May her roots be firmly established in the good soil of your word, nurtured and fed by your Holy Spirit. May she never be fooled into thinking she is not your child. May she be resolute in the truth that you love her unconditionally. And may she one day celebrate your love for her by becoming a disciple of Jesus, being baptized and committing her life to serving you for the rest of her days, not merely for herself, but for the life of the world. May Sayan and Rebecca rejoice in the gift that you have given them. Fill them with the graces of your spirit, granting them understanding, patience, and love so that under their guidance, Olivia may grow in wisdom, stature, and favor with you and others. And may we, your people, become a family of faith to this child, reminding her of your love for her and others, sometimes even challenging her to respond to all that may come with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. May we, as the body of Christ, get into the soil with Sayan and Rebecca as they nurture and raise this tree in your eternal ways. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. And part of our continuation in this rebellion... Uh, is that we're going to eat ice cream to celebrate after church, too. So, good, good news, too. Throw that in there. If you can rise in body or spirit. I think you'll agree with me that we are surrounded by kingdoms that don't want us to be gentle, kind, patient, loving, full of self-control. That is hard, hard work. And if you go out and you don't do those things, you are conforming. So I do pray that you would find the joy in rebellion this week. I pray that you would go, that the Holy Spirit would fill you with insight, with power and strength, not to overpower, not to take over, not to control, not to dismiss, not to put down, not to shame, but to invite people, to draw people to God's love in full and beautiful understanding of God's kingdom. May you experience God's upside-down kingdom this week, and may you participate in making it so. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Praise God from whom all